So next uh, speaker is Ayari Fuentes, who is going to talk about multi-scale experimental evolution of uh, antibiotic resistance. So thanks, Ayari, for being with us, even if not in person. Yeah, thank you very much, Jacopo, for the invitation. And I'm really sorry that I'm not there. But well, it's a great opportunity to, to that I can speak with you either way. So um, what I'm going to talk about is about um, a couple of, of of different work that I do in my lab. It has to do with experimental evolution in antibiotic resistance and particularly uh, not just evolution, but actually adaptation about antibiotic resistance in different scales. So of course, we all know that uh, antibiotic resistance is a multi-scale problem, which means that um, it's a very difficult problem to tackle. So in general, uh, we heard a lot about antibiotic resistance in the terms of populations, so the big population of epidemiology, and uh, in the settings of hospitals and those kind of things. But antibiotic resistance has um, his like his base in the molecules, in the genes, in the in the cells. So all these um, all these uh, scales actually are important to understand why is uh, why is a big problem now. So. Um, it happens not just, uh, not just in spatial scales, but also in temporal scales. So what we were interested in is what happened actually when um, like the first pulse of antibiotic resistance that, uh, that a bacteria can sense. And in the other hand, what happens in evolutionary times. But evolutionary times would mean like uh, weeks or maybe months. And the first uh, part of the talk is going to be uh, um, about rapid adaptation, and by rapid adaptation, I mean um, we are going to use single cell multi uh, microfluidics and imaging bioinformatics. So what we are going to see is a bacterial population that is subjected to a pulse of antibiotics and in a very, very small populations, which actually are going to, to do a, a difference between, uh, well, we're going to do a difference. and. The second part of the talk is going to be about evolutionary adaptation. And I mean evolutionary adaptation because we are going, to, uh, the time scale is going to be much, long, much longer. And the time scale is going to be enough for mutations to actually fix in the populations, which is not the case in the first part of the, of the, of the talk. So this is about uh, 100 generations and the population density is about millions or hundreds of millions. So just to start, uh, this is the people that is going to uh, that was involved in this um, in this work is um, Charlie Bruno, which is there, um, Alvaro San Millan, which is an, uh, in Spain, and Rafael Peña Miller, also from the Center of Genomic Sciences here in Mexico. So the system that we are using is Escherichia coli MG6055, which is the, uh, the most common Escherichia coli, actually, the, the lab Escherichia coli. And what we did is we put a multi-copy uh, plasmid. A plasmid is just a string of DNA that replicates itself within. Uh, it doesn't need the, 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 the bacteria uh, machinery to replicate. It's auto-replicating. So uh, this multi-copy plasmid has in average a, a between 19 and 20 uh, copies per cell. And it's not a conjugative plasmid, which means that they stay in the same cell. And uh, what we did is we put a beta-lactam resistant genes, a blatem one gene, and in the same, um, in the same promoter, we introduce a GFP fluorescent marker. So what we what you see uh, here is a clonal population. A clonal population means that actually those are uh, cells from the same cell. And uh, the green is going to see, well, when we see green, we are going to see the amount of plasmid that is within, uh, within a cell. So uh, the other thing that we are going, well, the device that we are measuring this, uh, these cells is a microchemostat. A microchemostat is a microfluidic chip, which is a really small piece of a, of a biopolymer. And uh, we are going to control it dynamically, which means that we can actually control the, um, the, the environment that the cells are seeing. So in here, we are going to have a very good control about the, the, when, we put, when we put the antibiotic, about the amount of antibiotic that we are putting and the time of the antibiotic that we are putting in. Um, we are using, a, well, all of this is actually put inside a fluorescent microscope to, 
in that in that sense we can see it and we can uh, measure everything and we are going to use quantitative analysis so the first video that i wanted to show is this is uh, one chamber one chamber of the micro uh, the micro chemostat and this is a clonal population this is a clonation from one cells the, the first thing that uh, you can notice is that you can see different amount of green different uh, degrees of green is not all green which means that uh, even though the population is in average 19 or 20 uh, copies per cell, actually we have a lot of heterogeneity in this clone of population. So when we are going to start seeing uh, red, when you start seeing red, this is the pulse of antibiotic. And this antibiotic, we are going to put some dye in it. So when they enter into the cell, uh, it turns, well, purple or red. And this means that uh, this is dead. If you notice it, uh, not all the cells die at the same time, actually. There, there, there were some of them that uh, lasted a little bit more. So what, what, thing, what, what are the kind of things that we can measure here? So in here, the, 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 the first square, the DIC one, is uh, how we see the, uh, uh, the, the cells from the microscope. And then we can measure, we can measure a lot of things using this bioinformatics. So uh, we can measure the GFP, which is uh, uh, how green it is. We can measure the DS red, which is uh, exactly the, the, the amount of red that there is in the environment and within the cells. We can track every cell, which means that we can, um, we can track the, the mother and then we can track the, the daughters and we can see if they are the same color, if they are not the same color. And then uh, we also measure the length which is going to be very important in here. I don't know if you notice, but we can we can see it actually in in the DIC image that the uh, the cells are, are are getting bigger, are getting longer and longer when the when the antibiotic is entered into the cell. And then we can measure division, which means that we can measure um, growth rates, which is important, of course. And then um, in this sense, what we did is we put a what we, think, we use this system, we put a, a pulse of antibiotic of 80 minutes. And what you can see here, and in the right, in the left part, you can see the, uh, the, the, the track cells and um, we, can, we, we are there measuring uh, which one are bigger and which one are normal and which one are dead. So as you can see, the, the, the result is very heter heterogeneous. There are some uh, cells that are stressed, which means that the, the yellow ones are the ones that are going to get bigger. There are some that are dead and there are some that are actually normal. So what we wanted here now is to compare to a system when there is no, this, uh, there is no uh, this heterogeneity. So what we did now is we took the bacteria, we removed the plasmid, and we introduced the, this, um, this gene, this beta-lactam gene, both in the chromosome to see what is the, um, now what is the response of this small population, but now uh, it has exactly the same, uh, the same resistant gene, but now in the chromosome. What we, uh, what we put here, the, the video is not very good, but you can see that, oh, I'm going to repeat it. You can see that uh, the, the antibiotic enters and the response is very, very synchronous. Every, all, almost all the population turns um, yellow, and then it, is, it turns uh, blue again very quickly. So this is just all like all the experiment put in the top of, of it. We have the population that has the um, that has the blood temp gene, the mutant gene in the chromosome, and in the bottom we have the population that has uh, that has it in plasmid. So what we can see here is that the stress population. When we have a, when we have it in plasmid, is a small amount, and the when we have it in in the chromosome, it's a big amount of the population. So this means that the population, as I already told you, is going to respond like like really synchronous when they have the um, the chromosomal mutation. But this uh, this heterogeneity that the the plasmid is giving them does uh, respond. Uh, make the population respond as a heterogeneous population to the drug population. So now, what is um, now what is the consequence of this effect in uh, in, a, in a 
bigger population, like at a population level. So what we did next is to do a population level experiment with a pulse of antibiotic, but now uh, in plates, in 96 with plates. Uh, this has, um, instead of, well, it has like really big populations, we have 200 microliters of, of bacteria in each of, the, of, of that well. And what we see is exactly the same, that the survival probability is going to increase a lot when the um, when the blood well when the mutation is going to be varying in the plasmid, so this um, this multi this multi copy plasmid is going to increase survival to fluctuating environments. And by fluctuating environments, we mean I mean pulse of antibiotics. So what we did here is um, this experiment is just uh, we have the populations in ninety six well place. Then we do a transfer to a in different times from half an hour to six hours. And then we uh, remove the antibiotic and we let the population uh, grow again. So that is the, 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 that, that, like, that is the experiment on how, how we measure uh, survival. And now the next step is what happened if we let one of these plasmid mutate, which is something that happens in nature. So in here, we are going to have the, 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 the cell. The cell is going to have this uh, in average 19 or 20 plasmids. And what if one of these plasmids actually mutates? And when, the, when it mutates, it's going to generate a heterozygous cell. And by heterozygous cell, I mean, they are going to have two different mutants in the same cell, two different, well, yes, two different mutants in the same cell. And then, um, for this, for the system that we are using, this uh, beta lactam system, what is going to happen is going to 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 have another beta lactam in the cell. So we wanted to see what's happening here. So what we see, uh, what we did is to uh, to build another uh, another bacteria that uh, have the same plasmid, but now we are going there is going to have a blood M12 which is just one mutation for the blatum one, and we are going to put it in red. So now we have two different uh, systems, one that the, the green one, the, the one that have blatum one, and the one that have blatum 12. And by the other hand, we are going to have a third one that is going to have exactly the two of them in the same cell. So it's going to be a heterozygous cell. So when we see red, is, is a population that have Latin uh, 12. When we see green, it's a population that have Latin 1. But when we see yellow, it's going to be a heterozygous population. And we wanted to see why why, uh, why actually this heterozygous population exists in nature. So in here, now we are going to use what we call a mother machine, which is another microfluidics device. And in here, the, micro, the mother machine, what is what we do is we uh, we put the cells in there. The mother cell is going to stay on the top, and so we can follow. Actually, we can track all the all the uh, all the daughters. So we see there. This is a drug-free environment, and the first thing that we wanted to measure is if if there is a like a tendency of going to one of. Uh, we start with a heterozygous population. So we wanted to see if at the end of the experiment in that drug in a drug-free environment, we have one uh, more of the blatum one or more of the blatum 12. And we realized that as we expected that this, uh, this plasma dynamics is actually just a noise driven process. So some of them are getting redder, are getting more red, some of them are getting uh, greener, but it's completely random. So what happened now if we introduce pulse of antibiotics? So in this, in this video, in the top of it, we are seeing a heterozygous population, but now with a pulse of ampicillin. Ampicillin is the is um, is antibiotic that Latin one is, uh, is resistant for. And then in the bottom one is going to be a pulse of, of septacidine of the same population, but septacidine is the antibiotic at, by which uh, LATEM12 is resistant for. So as you can see, uh, when we introduce the antibiotic with the, the ramp of antibiotic, uh, 
the actual the, the, the amount of antibiotics that we are using is very very high. So we want we wanted to see if uh, the if the one that uh, that we put ampicillin in shifted into greener and the other one into red. But uh, by the end of the experiment, everything is almost is all is almost dead. So we see elongation, we see stress stress bacteria, and then we, we measure actually the shift. We can see it. we can see it if we introduce ampicillin, there is a shift towards the, the green, and when we introduce heptacillin, it, uh, there is a shift towards the the red. But then, why is this optimal, or why is why why we see this in uh, in the population, like? In, in that sense, heterogeneous uh, heterozygous cells has less uh, has less uh, resistant genes of one kind. So, what we realize is, with, if we shift, if we do like a fluctuation environment between the two of them, the two antibiotics with ceftazidim and ampicillin, this is optimal, and the and actually we can save the population. So, uh, in this video, what we are doing is we are putting uh, in some time, uh, septacillin and some time ampicillin, but in the same amount that the that the previous one. So this is a lot of antibiotic, but actually shifting this uh, this antibiotic can actually stabilize the population, and we have uh, well we can we can have the population for several times. So maybe this this is why it's optimal exactly. So the conclusion for the first part is that uh, this multi-copy plasmid acts as platform for rapid gene application, and this accelerates the rate of adaptation, which is the first part. No, that, that means that this uh, just heterogeneous, uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, response of the antibiotic can make that the the population actually can survive longer time to anti to to this uh, well to pulse of antibiotics a really high pulse of antibiotics and um, heteroplasmy is unstable in environments which constant selection but actually is very stable and stabilize uh, the population in fluctuating selection so this is well, this was uh, this was interesting for us then the second part of the talk it's going to be about evolutionary adaptation, which, uh, as I already told you, is going to be like um, proper evolutionary experiments, like with enough time, with uh, within days, weeks, or months, with enough time to mutations to fix in the populations. In the other, um, in the previous part, mutations were already there, and we were just seeing how they um, how they act and rapid adaptation. So these uh, these are the persons who were involved in this part of the project, which is Sandra Cisneros, Lucia Graña, and Deyanira Perez. Uh, all of them were from Mexico. So to introduce this, I'm going to, to introduce a very simple and naive uh, uh, population dynamics model. So what we are going to do is first um, just to see how a clonal population actually adapt to antibiotics. So I'm going to, the, the, the way that we are going to model adaptation to antibiotics is going to be through a, through a mutation. So we are going to have a, a wild type, a susceptible uh, population, which is this BWT. And then this susceptible population are going to have two avenues uh, in order to make, uh, to make it uh, resistant. It's going to be, it could be, very strong resistant at a, at a very high, high cost, or very or mild resistant and a low at a low cost. So this is how um, it's going to. They are going to see in the terms of the model. So if we increase the antibiotic concentration, of course, the susceptible one is going to die uh, quickly, and then this, the very resistant one is going to die at, at the end of the of of the of the x axis. But then in terms of bacterial density, in absence of antibiotic, the, of course, the susceptible one is going to, to grow better, but then uh, the resistant one is the one that's going to grow last. So, well, this is just the, the kind of the, the general definition of how we are going to model these populations. And uh, the, um, the change between those populations is going to be uh, just a probability of a point mutation with an epsilon uh, uh, bigger than, than zero. So that's a, well, that's a usual ODE problem. And now, 
if we introduce a ramp of antibiotic, which, which means that uh, we are going to try to model an um, evolutionary experiment. In this evolutionary experiment, uh, every day we are going to change the, uh, the media to fresh media. So every day is going to have like, uh, again, the complete amount of, of, of of resources, but we are going to start introducing antibiotic in an increasing way. We are going to do a, we are going to call it an adaptive ramp. So if we do this in the model, what we see is that if the relative frequency between these those three populations shifted like kind of quickly between uh, all the population to be, be susceptible, susceptible to be a little bit resistant. If we, if the amount of antibiotic is not very high, we are going to have, like in the, like in, in this graph that I am showing you, we are going to have the population that is mild resistant, actually. And as, um, a small part of the population is going to be very, very resistant. Now, we are going to define uh, what we are going to, to, to call the rate of adaptation, which is how uh, fast, actually, they adapt to the antibiotic. And it's just going to be the delta MIC. MIC is a minimal inhibitory concentration, which is the concentration at which we don't see growth anymore. And uh, this is going to be uh, divided by two times the time of adaptation of the uh, of the of this MIC that we are getting. And then, uh, as I told, I already told you, this is the case that uh, we are not in. The, uh, the increase of the antibiotic is not very high, the antibiotic as which we are uh, subjective in. And then we are going, uh, what happened now if we increase the antibiotic of the ramp, of this adaptive ramp? So what we expected is that exactly the amount, the population get to the same MIC, uh, but in, uh, in, a, in a shorter time. And actually, which is uh, start to be interesting, is that the, uh, the population is different. You no, know? the, the shape of the population is different. And if we measure actually the the final population within these uh, these two cases, if we just measure resistance, this is not going to be distinguishable. The, like the, the phenotype is going to be exactly the same. But if you see the uh, composition of the population, is very very different. So what we when we realize this was. We were puzzled about what happened now, or how these different populations respond to um, respond now to uh, if we remove the antibiotic and then if we put the antibiotic again. So, uh, well, in this sense, the rate of adaptation, as we expected, is correlated with the strength of selection. If we put more uh, more antibiotic, uh, this means that uh, we have. Uh, the, cell, the strength selection is higher and the rate of adaptation is higher. But then we put the drug-free environment, we put the same amount of the drug-free environment, and what we see is that the population actually responds very different. The population in the mild selection is not going to be uh, naive, again, but like the, the, the removal of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the resistance is going to decrease like a slower, in a slower rate, and uh, in, in, in contrast with the strong population that actually with, within the same amount of drug-free environment, they are going, all the population is going to be naive again. And then if this, if, if this population is subjected again to, ad ad to adaptive ramp, of course, it's going to respond in a different way. So, so we have this uh, very, simple model, and we decided that uh, there was something like interesting in there. So we decided to do the actual experiment to see if this happened, like if, if the population actually uh, responded different just because they, they had a different composition. So we decided to do the experimental evolution adaptation in this adaptive ramp. And again, we use uh, the same system that we were using, uh, the Scherichia coli MG65, we remove, of course, the plasmid. In here, we are not using plasmid. It's just the, the, the Escherichia coli, like the normal Escherichia coli. And we are going to use serial transfers and ampicillin. So we are measuring every day uh, the MICs for, the, for 22 drug concentrations. And we freeze everything. And uh, we are going to have like 
two different uh, two different treatments: the strong selection and the mild selection. For the strong selection, what we uh, what we are going to to pass every day is what we are going to call the IC90, which is the um, inhibitor inhibitor concentration at 90 percent and what we what we did is we measure the mic and we transfer the uh, the population like the next population that the last population that we see actually grow that we detect growth and by the mice selection we what we did is we measure the mic we um, and we transfer the ic50 which is the population at 50% of the inhibition. So they were uh, two very different treatments. And we did this for every day. So that is why we call adaptive RAM, because every day we have a different MIC, which means that we have a, a different IC90 and a different IC50. And we did this until we reached the 10 MIC of the parental strain. So um, this is the phase, what we call the phase one. So what we see here uh, in, in this graph is uh, in the x y x, x uh, axis we put generations and in the y axis we put normalized mic and in average both of the populations are uh, 10 mic uh, 10 mic but uh, as we can see here the strong selection is going to be uh, it's going to be to get there really fast and actually the mild selection is going to be very noisy it's going to be slower and it's going to be noisy so uh, it, and it takes more, it takes longer time. No? So what we see here is exactly what we saw in the in the model that the rate of adaptation is again correlated with the strain of selection, and um, with the intensity of selective pressure. No? but again, uh, when we uh, if we measure the um, uh, the populations, if we just measure the uh, resistant population. Uh, at the end of this experiment, they are exactly the same. Like they, we cannot distinguish between one or, or the other. But the evolutionary history is start to be different, of course. So we um, did the whole gene sequencing of this part, and for the strong selection, what we see is that uh, just three mutations were at one hundred percent of the populations: um, ACR, RPOD, and CLP exon. So these were the only mutations that we saw. So the, the first thing that actually surprised us is the um, the very few mutations that they have, <clears throat> and that they very, and they were like completely in the whole population. Now these mutations actually drive the uh, this uh, this fast uh, response to the antibiotic. And in contrast, for the mild selection, uh, there uh, there are parallelism between the the replicas and. We, find, we found just two mutations at 100% of the population. Like we have more mutations, which is not surprising because the amount of, uh, the, the length of the experiment for the mild selection were longer. So of course there were more, more mutations accumulated, but in, in there uh, we found more, uh, more mutations within the, 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 uh, the replicas. So <clears throat> now that we have this, we, well, now that we have these two different uh, populations, we remove the antibiotic, and we remove the antibiotic for eight days for the both treatments. And what we see here is, if we measure the MIC, which we measure how the well, the first uh, result is that both populations actually decrease their resistance uh, in a drug-free environment. But the amount, the the rate at which the resistance is decreased is was very different. For the uh, strong selection, if you can see, just in few generations, uh, they remove the, it lowers a lot. And for the mild selection, actually it's quite stable and then it's removed, it is, uh, um, the resistance is lowering, but in a, in a, uh, in a uh, small rate. So also for, for mild selection, uh, the resistance actually is not uh, well. The population is not completely naive, as uh, uh, as we kind of see in the in the strong selection. So this is again very similar that we have to the in the in the model. And what we see here is, uh, I kind of already told you, is that uh, the the uh, the reduction of resistance is also negatively correlated with the level of resistance. If the if they become very uh, 
resistance very fast, they uh, they decrease the resistance, and which could uh, and this could mean that the mutations that acquire in uh, the strong selection were actually very very uh, costly, so they remove it very fast, which is a uh, which which is the contrary to what happened in the mild selection. So now that we have here, that we are here, we put again the anti we put again another ramp of antibiotic to this uh, population, and we wanted to see what was the effect of this evolutionary history in the second uh, in the in the second uh, well in the, in the second pulse of antibiotic. And now this is the result. Um, as you can see, they are they respond exactly well, kind of the same. No, it's a bit noisy, but they are very they respond very very fast. The rate of adaptation is very fast, and now they follow very similar evolutionary trajectories. And now, we, if we compare the, the if we compare the the two treatments and the two different phases of antibiotic, what we can see is that the only phase that we can actually distinguish between the between them is the mild selection, the first phase of the mass of the mild selection. All the others are completely indistinguishable. And then um, this surprises us a lot in the sense that the mild selection, this, the, the second uh, the the third phase of the mild selection Actually, the rate of adaptation is very fast, and they actually became uh, even more uh, resistant than the other one. So, of course, this population is better, uh, like it, it's very prepared to tackle to antibiotic. But this population never saw like very high amount of antibiotic, and this is very uh, well. This is this is this was something that um, surprised us. So, as you can see here, when we measure the rate of adaptation, there the Rate of the uh, the higher rate of adaptation is the phase three of the mild selection, even higher than any of the strong selections. And if we uh, if we see the relative fitness of compensation adaptation, uh, as we can see here, the only the, just the phase two of the strong selection is actually over one in the relative fitness, and this this means that the the fitness cost of this evolved population are going to remain a constant through the experiment, no? And these resistant mutations of the strong selection, it, they are going to be rapidly compensated in this cost of selection. And then uh, this is how the RAMs, the actual RAM C, like the, the, the three phases of the RAM. And uh, the only, well, the difference between them actually is just the phase one in terms of the, of the length of the experiment. And now, uh, we see more accumulated mutations in the mild selection. And uh, if we do the whole gene sequencing now, therefore, the, if we compare it in the first phase, in the second phase, and in the third phase, what we see here is that the, for the strong selection, we see uh, like mutations in the whole population at 100% of the population, but then they decrease and then they, uh, they uh, go up again. But they are not the same mutations necessarily. So for the third phase, actually, the rate of adaptation is equally fast. But they are another; they are other mutations. They are not the same mutations as the first phase. And in contrast, for the mice selection, um, the thing that was very interesting is that um, there were more mutations. There were more mutations that were in the in the um, in the whole population, and even though if they were not in the whole population, uh, for the phase two, actually for the for the part of the drug-free environment, they were covered now in the 100% population, and the and the mutations actually were stable. They um, they don't they didn't decrease for phase two, and then for phase three we have more mutations, but the mutations actually stable were maintained. It's like this uh, my selection of uh, of antibiotic have has it's like having a memory that uh, it doesn't have the strong selection. So just to conclude uh, now this part is that the rate of adaptation is going to be proportional to the strength of selective pressure. This strength of selection is going to shape the mutational spectra. Uh, the, the mutations are going to depend of the evolutionary history on how many, uh, like the time of at which uh, the exper well the bacteria were subjected to antibiotic and how much antibiotic they see. And this mild selection favors the stability of these resistant mutations. 
and evolutionary history and external selection determine the rate of persistent adaptation. And I think uh, we think this is relevant because a lot of times when we are uh, when we are talking about antibiotic resistance, we are neglecting all this uh, a small amount of antibiotics that are um, that are in the environment. And actually, we can see here that they are shaping a lot of the of the resistant mutation. And uh, these resi these resistant mutations are stable, and in contrast with the other ones. So, well, all together we can see that drugs persistent adaptation occurs in multiple time scales. This mild selection increased genetic diversity in the population and this accelerated resistant adaptation in fluctuation environments. And we also saw that uh, this um, uh, plasmid copy number variability is going to increase also genetic diversity and is going to result in a resistant population. And this is going to be important in survival uh, within fluctuation environment also and this multicopy plasmid replication is going to increase intracellular genetic diversity. So then uh, what we are seeing here is that if we have more, more, diversity, more di diversity, actually populations are going to be able to uh, respond better to the antibiotics. And we also think that this is going to be relevant if we now uh, explore this in polymicrobial communities, which is the thing that a little bit more natural. In polymicrobial communities, we are going to have very diverse populations with very, very diverse MICs. And this is going to happen along, well, it's going to happen a lot in there. So I think this is it. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take it. Thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions. Um, so I have a, actually a question. So when you were showing uh, the the mm -hmm. model uh, and uh, there were the two, the weak selection and the strong selection regimes, uh, in both cases, yes. uh, it seemed that the uh, weak resistant and the strong resistant strain were coexisting. Yes. Uh, I didn't understand what is uh. the mechanism that determines their coexistence. In here, so it's just in phase, uh, in phase one, yeah, yeah, just at the end of phase one. Yes, yes. Yeah. In, well, in here it's just that uh, mutation is just a, a, a random parameter, isn't it? And just if we have a higher amount of the antibiotic, the strong mutation is going to stay in the environment longer time. So if we don't, if it's just more more costly. So if you don't have enough antibiotic, uh, like in the case of my selection. You don't need this uh, strong selection, this, this is uh, like very strong selective uh, bacteria, but they are coexisting all the time. So uh, we are also, this is, uh, these experiments are, uh, are uh, uh, parametricized with the experimental data. So this is not, uh, this is not in, in, in a stationary phase, no? This is just uh, every time I stop the, the 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 simulation. I don't know if I'm. I don't know if you understand me. Uh, yes, in part. In part, I don't. I'm not sure if well, I, if I see. I mean, I understand that there is a cost for the for the uh, strong yes. resistant. What I don't understand is why. Uh, I mean, there is a balance of the cost and the benefit, and either the weak resistant or the strong resistance displace the other? Or it's like just because there is a balance, I mean, there is like a sort of selection mutation balance where... Uh, yes. Uh, it's because of that, okay. Yes, Okay. yes, yes. Okay. And, okay. But the thing that I wanted to say, this is not in a steady state. Okay. Yet. So okay. this is, this, if, if you continue the simulation, this is going to shift again. Okay, yeah. okay. Thanks. We have time uh, for uh, for other questions. Okay. If not, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Let's thank the thank speaker you. again. Thank you very much. Michael. Thank you very much.